so yeah, that's that's me. I'm uh, Tommy Rampling. I'm a consultant physician in infectious diseases. I, I work at UCLH. Uh, my role there is is both as a as an infection doctor, um, but also uh, I, I'm helping to run the the vaccine trials uh, that we're recruiting for there. Um, and then the other part of my job, the other 50%, I work at the Rare and Imported Pathogens Lab at Public Health England. What I'm going to try and do today uh, is cover um, uh, COVID vaccines, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's an enormous topic already. Um, there's just been an, an overwhelming uh, surfeit of, uh, of, of publications in, in the world of COVID vaccines. Um, I mean, the, the last year has been uh you know horrendously stressful and difficult for an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of us but um but but it's been a remarkable year for vaccinology really um and i'm going to try and give you as much of an overview of that as i can um so i'm going to start off by just just going over some some brief aspects of vaccines and how they work and different types of vaccines and how vaccines are developed but then then focus on on the specifics of vaccine technology um and how that's been apply, applied in the in the covid era um, we'll have a, a short break and maybe an opportunity for some questions, and then um, try to address some of the um, some of the the maybe more pressing or controversial um, uh, aspects. So, what what have the what's the real world impact of COVID vaccines been so far? You know, uh, aspects around around the rare safety signals identified in the post deployment era, and then some key questions. Um, that, that some of you may have, have thought about it or, or maybe not, um, but, but we'll try and address some of those. And then just one slide on, on the, the future and, and how we can learn, learn from our experience over the last 14 months or so. So um, uh, vaccines obviously are a fantastic uh, public health uh, intervention. Um, and the, the concept of vaccination is, well, it's it's really been around since as far back as maybe the the 16th century in China, but but um, but really um, pioneered and brought into the, the the mainstream by by Edward Jenner and his work in the in the late 18th century. Um, just included these these cartoons just to highlight the fact that that um, vaccine hesitancy uh, isn't isn't really necessarily a new problem. Um, uh, my particular favourite is the is the cartoon on the bottom, uh, which is a uh, uh, supposed to represent people worried that they might uh, develop cow-like appendages uh, after being uh, after being variolated with with cowpox, uh, which was obviously the, the the first vaccine that was designed to present prevent against uh, against smallpox. And um, you know, vaccines have been uh, responsible for uh, substantial uh, reductions in global health um, in, in global mortality due to uh, diseases. Um, you know, they're, they're one of the most cost effective uh, public health uh, interventions and really uh, they, they are what led to the eradication of smallpox, the only infectious disease that we have successfully uh, eradicated so far, and the near eradication of, of polio. Um, vaccines are usually, usually relatively easy to implement uh, and they have the benefit of both offering direct protection to individuals but also uh, indirect protection in the form of uh, herd immunity. And there have been a number of uh, vaccine initiatives over the years, um, you know, designed to improve the access um, to vaccines uh, amongst various populations, but particularly in low and middle income settings. And there was this um, amazing paper that was published uh, earlier this year in The Lancet, uh, which looked at um, uh, nine or ten uh, vaccine preventable diseases and the, the, the modelled impact uh, over um, the 30 years um, since the, the, the turn of the millennium um, and, and the number of uh, deaths that they may have uh, averted. And, um, and, and you know, the, the y-axis here is, is uh, millions of deaths um, uh, averted by vaccination. You can see um, they're estimated to have had a really uh, astounding effect in the number of lives, uh, number of lives saved. And there's a variety of different types of vaccines, which we would consider uh, traditional types of vaccines. So live attenuated vaccines are probably the most uh, basic, where you take a, a pathogen and um, uh, it's, it's still alive, it can still reproduce, um, uh, but it's been attenuated. So it, it either has lost its disease uh, uh, causing capacity or its disease causing capacity has been greatly reduced. And um, 
uh, there's a few types of, of live attenuated vaccines, so uh, measles, mumps, rubella, yellow fever, the oral polio vaccine, and the live attenuated influenza vaccine. Um, and these are great because they give you a, a very broad um, immune response against the whole pathogen, uh, but they also have their problems in that they you know, that they often can't be given to selected populations, particularly those who are heavily immunocompromised, but also sometimes in pregnancy it's, it's problematic. Um, the next most basic is, is probably the inactivated whole pathogen uh, vaccine. So this is where you take the whole pathogen, such as the whole virus, and then it's inactivated through either heat or chemicals. Um, and uh, examples of those types of vaccines are the inactivated polio, hepatitis A, rabies, Japanese encephalitis, and the tetravalent uh, flu vaccine. Protein subunit vaccines are when you take a, just a single protein component uh, from the pathogen uh, and then uh, through various means you uh, prepare it for delivery. And sometimes that can be quite, um, uh, quite elegant, such as with, with hepatitis B, where it's formed into virus-like particles. So technically what you have is the, the protein subunit, which is formed uh, essentially the same as the, the virus shell, but none of the, the nasty bits inside uh, that can allow for, for production of, of new virions. And that's often given uh, alongside an adjuvant, which is a, a, a chemical substance that can boost your immune response when the vaccine is given. Polysaccharide vaccines are, are you know, similar in, in concept, but, but usually for bacteria, we take a, a polysaccharide component from the, from the bacterial uh, cell wall, um, and there are vaccines for Haemophilus influenzae and pneumococcus that use that method. And then finally, there's the last type of traditional type of vaccine is the toxoid-based vaccines, where you essentially give the the toxin that the, the pathogen produces, and your, your aim there is to, is to neutralize the toxin uh, as opposed to the bacteria itself. Um, so uh, how do the vaccines protect through um, induction of, uh, of effector uh, immune mechanisms uh, that can either um, control or neutralize the actual replicating pathogen or inactivate the toxic components that the pathogen uh, generates. Um, but getting to that sort of vaccine mediated protection is, is quite a complex challenge. And there's a number of factors that you've got to, got to um, uh, you know, try and understand what their importance is. So um, obviously complete protection is, is, is generally considered the, the optimal uh, aim, but, but will partial protection be sufficient? Um, and uh, you know, is, is your vaccine going to uh, cover all, uh, all possible variations of, of the pathogen? So all different strains or all different variations, uh, you, uh, ge genomic variations? And how long is your vaccine induced protection going to last? So clearly some vaccine courses give lifelong protection, whereas some require boosters. And historically, uh, vaccines have largely been developed uh, empirically um, without a very good understanding of you know, how the disease activates the immune system, but also how the vaccine works. But we live in a modern era of, of molecular medicine um, and, and things are really very different now. So really we are working from the ground up here. So we're starting with a pathogen that we understand at a genomic level and a deep understanding of the, of the human immune biology. Um, and this allows us for, for a very different uh, method of, of vaccine development. Um, and what we're really trying to, to uh, induce through vaccines is uh, an adaptive immune response. And there's two real main components to that. So the first is the antibody mediated or, or humoral protection, which is considered to be the primary mechanism of early protective efficacy for most vaccines. Um, and antibodies are produced by uh, B lymphocytes, so a type of white blood cell. Um, and antibodies are then capable of binding specifically to a pathogen itself or to the toxin, uh, and then uh, exerting their, their, their effect by that mechanism. And the key things to think about whilst developing a vaccine is how high uh, do your antibody titers need to be? So how much antibody do you need to produce? But also, uh, how do you maximise the quality of the antibodies? So this concept of uh, avidity and affinity, so how well uh, an antibody binds to its antigenic target. Um, but also, you know, are your antibodies specific to the thing that you're trying to uh, induce antibodies against, or are, are they likely to be bound to lots of uh, non-specific other antigens and therefore maybe reducing their effect. And then once they've bound, what is their neutralizing capacity going to be? So how well do these antibodies actually work once they've bound to your antigen? And then as mentioned before, durability is a, is a consideration. So how can you make your antibodies last above a protective threshold for as long as possible? And how can you maintain that immune memory? And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of that a little bit later on. 
and this is really important this concept of immune memory is vitally important because you, know, you need rapid and effective uh, secondary immune response once you uh, encounter a pathogen for a second or a third or multiple times further down the line the second component of the adaptive immune system to activate is the is the cellular component uh, and, uh, and T cells, uh, and this is essential um, to for two reasons. So there's the direct contribution to protection. So uh, cytotoxic uh, affected T cells um, can can um, you know, limit spread of infectious agents because they can recognise and then kill uh, infected cells. Um, and they can also secrete um, uh, antiviral cytokines, uh, which can which can exert their effect through through that mechanism. And you know this kind of cytotoxic T cell response is thought to be particularly important uh, to uh, control intracellular pathogens. So that's very important for a lot of viral infections. But they also have this supportive role uh, to the maintenance of, of B cell uh, responses and they're vital, uh, T cells are vital for induction of high affinity antibodies and also uh, to generate immune memory. But it's not always uh, easy to produce effective vaccines and there are several um, diseases that have really demonstrated that. So people have been trying to, to develop effective vaccines against uh, HIV, malaria and TB for, for years and years now. You know, three really big infectious disease killers that we would love to have vaccines for. And you probably all heard the news about um, uh, the malaria vaccine on Friday, which is, which is great news, but has yet to be borne out in larger scale clinical trials and in real world settings. But you know, this, this is the culmination of you know, over 80 years of, of malaria vaccine research. Um, and uh, and you know, it's really been a, a big struggle. Um, and the efficacy of some vaccines that we have currently is, is really not as good as it could be. Um, sometimes vaccines can be expensive. Sometimes they can be difficult to implement with issues such as cold chain uh, being difficult to maintain, especially in some settings. The safety of vaccines can be problematic. Um, so things like uh, the yellow fever vaccine has got some, some safety complications. Um, and in certain populations, it can be uh, particularly problematic. Then there's this concept of immune escape, uh, which is, uh, you know, has come to the fore recently. You know, uh, is, is there, is there going to be issues with uh, uh, the pathogen evading the, uh, the protective immune response that you've generated? And then finally, um, uh, a problem that we've been dealing with, particularly since the, the turn of the millennium, is this, this idea of vaccine hesitancy and trying to to stop the spread of, uh, uh, of misinformation and trying to make sure that we have as much uh, take up of, of, of vaccine um, rollout as possible. So um, just to try and give an idea as to what has been so remarkable about the, the COVID vaccine development over the last 14 months. So on, on the top here, we've got the traditional um, uh, vaccine development pipeline, which takes you know, at a very minimum 10 years but usually 15 years and often longer and you have all of these different stages which happen um, in uh, in a sequential fashion uh, with the, with all of the preclinical work from the design of the the, the vaccine itself the preclinical animal work um, and then and then the, the clinical studies which which can take years and years and years and all uh, traditionally happen uh, in individual components so just for those who are unfamiliar with the phases of clinical uh, drug development, phase one uh, clinical trials are the, usually the first in man, uh, the first in human studies. Um, these are usually very small numbers where the primary objective is uh, safety, uh, but also uh, dose ranging. So this is where you will find the optimum dose and you would usually start very low and work your way up and, uh, you know, uh, and, and stopping at any point if there are any safety signals identified. Once you've got your phase one results, uh, you move on to your phase two studies, which are larger, recruiting maybe anywhere between sort of 50 and 500 uh, participants. And again, you'll be developing, you'll be um, observing safety in these studies primarily, but just at a larger scale. But you can also get some idea from these studies about immunogenicity of these vaccines and possibly some early efficacy uh, if you're lucky. Um, and then uh, finally, moving on to the phase three studies, that's when you know, you're really your primary objective is to assess the efficacy of your of your vaccine. Um, and uh, these are the much larger studies where you're recruiting 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40 or larger thousand participants. Um, and whilst you know safety and immunogenicity data will continue to be collected, your primary readout there will be efficacy. 
Um, and then uh, after that, you submit your documents to the regulatory authorities and you can start producing your vaccine at scale if you're successful. But in the, in the COVID era, all of that has had to be compressed. Um, and one of the, the reasons that it's all been able to uh, move so fast is because of a lot of the work that was done for SARS-CoV um, in uh, the um, earlier part of uh, the, well, in two, from 2003 onwards. Um, and the lessons learned from SARS-CoV vaccine development and then subsequently for, for MERS-CoV uh, vaccine development as well, uh, which has been ongoing over the last few years. So a lot of the work around uh, the discovery phase had already been done. But also you can see there's, there's this compression of the uh, clinical drug development uh, uh, pathway as well, where there's overlapping of the phase one, the phase two, and the phase three studies. And in parallel, you've got this um, uh, uh, you know, production, drug production or vaccine production, which is done at risk. So producing millions and millions of doses of vaccine in parallel to the clinical trial work um, in the hope that the, the vaccines are going to prove safe and efficacious um, and then at which point once you've got that evidence then you'll be able to say well look we've already got the vaccine ready to go and then there's this accelerated review by the regulatory authorities such as the FDA in America, the European Medicines Agency in Europe and the MHRA in the UK and that's how this sort of 15 year program can be compressed down to you know 10 months or, or, or so um, which is what we've seen uh, in COVID. So um, we're going to start talking about the actual uh, COVID vaccine candidates and um, the, the most of the vaccines that I'm going to talk about here are not the traditional types of vaccines that uh, I mentioned previously. So the first um, uh, type of vaccine I'm going to talk about is uh, the uh, RNA vaccines um, and um, mRNA uh, based vaccines. So um, I'm sure a lot of you in the in the audience will, will, will probably know a lot more about mRNA than I do, but um, just in case, so it's, you know, mRNA is obviously a nucleic acid and it's the intermediate step between the translation of protein encoding DNA and, and actual protein production. And um, uh, people have been working on the concept of RNA vaccines for a number of years, but there have been a number of, uh, a few problems that have have uh, you know held things up, but there have been two major types of uh, RNA uh, vaccines that that have potential. So the first is the non-replicating mRNA, which just essentially encode it's a it's a it's a bit of RNA sequence that encodes the antigen of interest. And then um, uh, then there's this idea of self-amplifying RNA, where the, your antigen um, uh, sequence of interest is is also fused to um, some viral replication machinery that allows for the RNA to be uh, amplified intracellularly and uh, this, this theoretically would allow for much more abundant protein expression. Uh, and there was some uh, fairly critical work uh, in uh, 2005 um, uh, that, uh, that demonstrated that if you um, so one of the problems with, with RNA is that it's, it's highly immunogenic and it, it stimulates the, um, the innate immune system when it's administered and then is very rapidly cleared uh, from the host after vaccination, whereas DNA um, had been uh, much more um, uh, uh, extensively evaluated as a vaccine platform because um, it's, it's less likely to get uh, destroyed uh, soon after vaccination. And um, this paper demonstrated that it's um, if you methylate uh, the RNA uh, using CPG motifs or, or, or through other mechanisms, you can actually lead to markedly reduced uh, immune activation. Uh, and therefore, um, this, uh, this led people to think that the, that the mRNA vaccines maybe had much more potential than they thought previously. Um, but uh, another problem with, with mRNA vaccines is they, that they need an effective delivery method. So if you just uh, inject some mRNA into somebody, it's, it's very unlikely to get into this, the, the cytoplasm of the cells, the host cells where it needs to get to, uh, to then um, uh, undergo uh, translation by the ribosomes. And, um, uh, and a variety of different methods have been proposed as to how you might be able to get uh, the RNA into the cells. But the one that has had the most traction uh, in the COVID vaccine um, uh, development uh, has, has been using lipid nanoparticles. So essentially you wrap your, your mRNA uh, molecule in, a, uh, in a, a, a lipid bubble. And this allows uh, the, uh, 
the, the mRNA to cross the lipid bilayer that's around the host cells and allow the mRNA to get intracellular where it needs to be. Um, and this is used, this mechanism is used in the two uh, mRNA uh, COVID vaccine candidates that I'm going to talk about. So the first is the BNT162B2, which is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And the second is the um, mRNA1273, which is the Moderna mRNA vaccine. So the Pfizer vaccine um, is, um, uh, has been modified, as I mentioned previously, so it's been methylated with uh, pseudouridine, uh, which dampens the immune uh, sensing uh, and uh, therefore allows for increased uh, in vivo mRNA translation. And it's been formulated into these lipid nanoparticles, as I mentioned before. Now, this mRNA uh, in the vaccine encodes for the full length spike protein. So you'll all by now be very familiar with the, uh, uh, what a COVID uh, or coronavirus looks like. So it's got these sort of trumpets that stick out from the, from the body of the, of the virus, um, which, are, which are the spike protein. Uh, and um, the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine encodes for the full length spike protein. Uh, but one of the things that they did, um, the, the people who developed this vaccine, is they uh, modified the spike protein by putting in two proline mutations at positions 986 and 987, and it locks it into the, um, the, the pre-fusion conformation, which um, uh, they believed um, would make it more, uh, well, firstly, make it more stable, but also more immunogenic. Um, and this confirmation is called S2P, and it's going to come up um, uh, you know, um, a few times because it's employed in a number of, uh, a number of the vaccines. So when, uh, when uh, Pfizer and BioNTech were evaluating these vaccines in the early studies, they looked at um, they, they, they essentially settled on two prime candidates. So the first, which uh, encodes the full length of the spike protein, which is the 162B2, and then a second uh, construct, which encoded just for the receptor binding domain. So just for the part of the protein that, that, that binds to the humanase 2. Um, and they evaluated both of these in humans. But what they found is that um, the immune responses that they generated were both were very similar. Um, but that the 162B1 actually uh, induced a, a, a few more side effects uh, than the 162B2. And so they chose the 162B2 to be advanced into the uh, phase three evaluation. So currently, the, this Pfizer vaccine is recommended for storage at minus 70, although um, they have submitted uh, stability data at minus 20, so normal freezer temperatures for up to two weeks. That's been submitted, and I think that's going to come through very soon if it's not already that approval. And the cost is about $20 per dose. So the, the Moderna vaccine um, is almost identical, really. So it also encodes for the full length uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and it also contains the same S2P mutations to lock it in that pre-fusion confirmation. And it's also formulated in lipid nanoparticles. Now, you know, it's quite, it's quite hard to find the exact details about all of this because these are um, obviously um, uh, intellectual property. Uh, but I think the lipid nanoparticles is the main way that the two vaccines um, uh, differ. So uh, the Moderna vaccine contains three commercially available lipids and then one proprietary uh, lipid product. Uh, but in contrast, the, the Moderna vaccine is stable at uh, fridge temperatures for up to four weeks, and it can be kept uh, for six months at minus 25. Um, so, um, so that is quite useful to know. But it is more expensive at 25 to 37 dollars per dose. And I've just put up there the timeline of the development of the Moderna vaccine, um, which is available on their website, just so you get an idea of how rapid this has been developed, but very much in line with the development, accelerated development pipeline, as I was discussing before. So um, just to give you an idea of how the safety is evaluated in these phase one and two trials, and I'm, I'm you know, we're going to talk about a few vaccines and I'm definitely not going to put up the safety profiles for all of these, but it's just to give you an idea for how these are evaluated. Um, so in the phase one and phase two studies, um, what happens is they, they vaccinate in a, a dose escalation fashion. So normally one participant will be vaccinated at the lowest dose. They'll give a period of time to elapse to evaluate the safety. If it appears safe, they will vaccinate a few more people at the low dose, and then usually a few more people at the low, at the low dose. When enough people have been vaccinated and enough time has been elapsed to evaluate the safety, they'll move on to the medium dose and then maybe a high dose until they get to the maximum dose that they're hoping to evaluate. And the participants will usually uh, collect what we call solicited adverse events. So, um, uh, 
you know, side effects or symptoms that we would expect to happen after a vaccine, such as pain in the vaccinated arm, redness or swelling, and then systemic effects such as fever or chills or fatigue or headache, um, uh, muscle or joint aches and that kind of thing. And those will normally be collected for a period, it's usually seven days after vaccination. And then after that, it's collecting mainly unsolicited adverse events. So, you know, anything you know, that occurs after those seven days uh, will be collected until the end of the trial usually. Uh, and these graphs just basically show, um, you know, the, the uh, adverse events and their severity. Um, so um, most of the adverse events that they found were uh, mild or moderate in severity, uh, and they all resolved spontaneously. And they found that uh, you know, pain, fatigue and chills were all common, and there were no vaccine related serious adverse events. But what was seen was that um, the adverse events after dose two uh, were worse than after dose one. Um, and this was actually something that was also seen with the mRNA vaccine. Um, so this is a very similar type of evaluation, but just from a different group in a different study uh, with a different vaccine. Um, but um, very common sort of vaccine type side effects. So a, a brief flu-like sy sy syndrome after vaccination and then some local effects of, of um, arm pain or redness or swelling, but with dose two being worse than dose one. And then uh, immunogenicity, again, I'm not going to sort of present this for all of the vaccines here because there is just so much data out there. But these vaccines will be evaluated for their immunogenicity uh, using a, a whole variety of methods. So what happens with uh, in these trials is they will um, uh, have a vaccine group and a placebo group. They will collect blood um, at baseline, so before vaccination, and they will measure uh, whatever it is they're looking for at baseline. And then they will collect it at, at pre-specified time points throughout the trial and looking for a change over baseline. Um, and there's a whole variety of different measures that are being employed in the COVID vaccine uh, trials. So they, there's, there's, there's measurement of antibodies and you can do just sort of basic uh, ELISA methods, but you can do ELISA against um, all, all, all kinds of different uh, targets. So you can use the uh, ELISA against the full length spike protein or just against the receptor binding domain or even against, um, against the whole uh, COVID virus. Or you can do um, neutralization assays. So at the, the, bottom, um, the bottom right there uh, is a plaque reduction neutralization um, assay where you're looking for actual neutralizing effect of the uh, vaccine recipient's serum um, on the culture of, of live virus. And that's, that's considered to be a more, um, uh, it's, 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 it's probably a closer measure of whether or not the vaccine is likely to be effective in, um, in real life, uh, but it is uh, more costly and more time consuming. But this is just to highlight there's a variety of different measures. And then for T cells to look for uh, adaptive T cell responses, there are uh, uh, several different measures that they can use there as well. So LA spots is one um, and uh, intracellular cytokine staining uh, by flow cytometry is, is the other method that they might use. But it's all about collecting blood at baseline uh, and then at serial time points throughout the study and then often comparing it to unvaccinated controls. Um, but ultimately, um, the, the, the summary from the mRNA vaccines from the phase one and two studies was that they were safe and immunogenic um, uh, and uh, no major safety signals were identified for either vaccine. So this was very then reassuring to take them forward into the phase three studies. And the phase three studies were, were fairly similar in design, obviously conducted completely separately by different groups, um, but uh, both large studies, so 30,000 in the Moderna study and nearly 44,000 in the Pfizer study. And the gold standard of uh, drug trials is to be randomized. So you're randomized to either receive the, the, act, the investigational product or um, either a placebo or a comparator vaccine. Um, and in these studies, they were randomized one to one. Um, and uh, the, other, the other factor um, that is important in gold standard of clinical trials is uh, for them to be double blinded. So for the people who are delivering the vaccine to be blinded as to which they're receiving, either placebo or vaccine, uh, but also for the participants themselves to be blinded. And the primary endpoint for both of these studies uh, was COVID illness. So PCR confirmed COVID illness, um, which was following a visit that was triggered by symptoms. So this is symptomatic COVID illness. And these plots here are, are uh, Kaplan-Meier plots um, or survival curves. So um, uh, if you're not familiar with Kaplan-Meier plots, this basically um, uh, uh, 
along the x-axis you've got time and along the y-axis you've got the um, proportion of uh, people still in the study who are um, who have not been diagnosed with COVID essentially um, and what you see here is that um, uh, up until about day 12 or 13 um, the, the curves are perfectly in sync and then after that that time after about day 12 or 13 um, there's this uh, amazing deviation between the two curves so on the uh, left we've got the, the Pfizer study uh, with the Pfizer vaccine group in red um, and the placebo group in blue and it's it's the other way around for the Moderna on the on the right hand side but they essentially both show um, uh, incredible uh, demonstration of efficacy of these vaccines of, of 94% um, for Moderna I think and 95 for, for Pfizer in this study. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, the uh, viral vectored vaccines now, um, and uh, th there's a few viral vectored vaccines uh, that are either um, being deployed now or in development for COVID. So the most famous one is probably the AstraZeneca vaccine, and uh, many of you probably have already had that by now. Unfortunately, it's got a few names, so uh, AZD1222, Chadox Incov19, or sometimes just the Oxford vaccine. Then there's also the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine, uh, which is ad 26 cov 2 s um, The Russians have been developing their uh, Sputnik V vaccine regimen, and then uh, in China, they're also developing a recombinant adenovirus serotype 5 based vector vaccine. So the way the viral vectors work uh, is you take a virus that is either not pathogenic to humans or has been modified so it's no longer pathogenic to humans. The DNA is modified uh, within that virus to encode for a gene of your choice. So in this case, um, they've inserted the, um, the gene for the, the, the COVID spike protein into this adenovirus. So it's not a COVID virus, it's the adenovirus that has been modified to encode for the COVID spike protein. Um, when the uh, host is, is vaccinated, the uh, adenovirus goes into the host cell uh, and then the, the DNA is uh, transcribed to mRNA uh, and uh, the, the, the protein is, is translated uh, and the, the, the spike protein can then be um, expressed on the cell surface either as whole uh, you know, spike protein molecules or as peptide fragments via MHC, which then you know, all of these mechanisms will then signal to the uh, immune system, but it will generate quite a holistic um, immune response, um, both uh, from the, the, the humoral and, and the cellular side. So the Chadox NCOV-19 or the AZD122 uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is based around a chimpanzee adenovirus. So um, the group in Oxford have been working on chimpanzee. This is really my home turf because you know I did my PhD with this group uh, on adenoviral vector vaccines um, for malaria and Ebola. Um, and they've got a lot of experience of using these chimpanzee adenoviral vectors. And the, the reason for using chimp ad as opposed to human adenoviruses is because the theoretically there's less likely to be uh, pre-existing antibodies um, to, uh, to this vector, and therefore you're less likely to clear it before you can uh, generate an immune response. They modify uh, the vector by deleting um, a, a, a gene at the E1 locus, which means that the, the, the virus can't propagate now in human cells. The only way the virus can, can replicate is uh, uh, in, in vitro when exogenous E1 is, is applied. So in human cells, in, in, uh, in vivo, uh, this uh, vector is replication incompetent. And in the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, it expresses the full length SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, but in this case, it's not pre-fusion stabilized. But the vaccine is stable at room temperature, uh, uh, fridge temperatures, so two to eight degrees, and it's very cheap. So it's uh, two to five dollars, depending on, on where, where you are. They published their phase one and two data in July of 2020, and it was found to be safe and immunogenic, but they found that a two-dose regimen resulted in higher peak antibody titers. Um, and, and they found that the majority of the, the adverse events were, were moderate, uh, mild to moderate, and they resolved spontaneously. Interestingly, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the first dose seemed to be worse than the second dose, which is in contrast to the mRNA vaccines. And there was one serious adverse event in the phase one and two trial of trans transverse myelitis, but uh, on subsequent review by the Independent Neurological Committee, it was found to be not related to the vaccine. 
So they then went on to do the phase three study, uh, which was conducted in, well, it was being conducted in the UK and Brazil, but the, the primary analysis, uh, well, and South Africa, but the primary analysis just uh, included the UK and Brazil cohorts. Um, and this study created quite a lot of confusion when the, the results were, were published um, because it was initially planned as a single dose study, but it was then amended uh, once the phase one and two data uh, came out to show that a prime boost regimen, two dose regimen was better. Uh, and this is, you know, an effect of when you're concertina in your clinical uh, drug development phases, um, that kind of data is going to emerge whilst you're already uh, uh, got your trial underway. And so a second dose was introduced into this study, but it meant that there was a variable prime boost interval of anywhere between four and 12 weeks. And there was also this issue with uh, vaccine dose calibration uh, when it was manufactured, which resulted in a proportion of participants, like 24, 25% of participants receiving a low dose for their first dose. This was subsequently corrected um, so that the remaining three quarters received two standard doses. But again, this led to a bit of confusion when the results came out because the paper was published with lots of uh, different subgroup analyses, uh, depending on the prime boost interval, those who'd only had one dose, those who'd had a low dose followed by a standard dose. But the upshot of it all was um, there was efficacy seen in all groups. Um, and the efficacy was somewhere between, depending on, on how you broke it down, you know, uh, 60 to, to 90 percent. But it was probably sitting somewhere around the 70 percent mark if you looked at all of the vaccinees as a whole. Uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, AD26-CoV2S, um, is very similar. It's just it uses a human adenovirus serotype 26 um, versus the chimpanzee adenovirus. But it's got the E1 deletion as well. And it encodes for the full length spike protein, but this time it is in the prefusion confirmation. Um, but this vaccine was always de developed from the outset to be a single dose regimen. And this is what uh, was evaluated in their phase one and two studies, but also what was taken forward into their phase uh, three efficacy study. And this one uh, really is uh, very hot off the press. It's literally only just been published, um, the uh, AD26. COV2S efficacy trial, uh, which is an international multi-center double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial in, uh, in a number of different countries where they evaluated a single dose with uh, 40,000 uh, vaccinated people in the, well, uh, uh, participants in the paraprotocol analysis with a one-to-one -one randomization. Um, and the efficacy really for a single dose uh, vaccine regimen um, looked, looks really good. So uh, about 67% efficacy, um, 14 days after vaccination, um, which uh, which really is is great, and and uh, no COVID uh, related deaths in the in the uh, vaccination arm. So this single dose, uh, cheap to produce, stable uh, ad 26 vectored vaccine really does look pretty good. Meanwhile, uh, the Russians were developing their Sputnik V vaccine regimen. Uh, this one is interesting because um, it uses two different vectors uh, given in a prime boost sequence. So they use a human adenovirus serotype 26, followed by a human adenovirus serotype 5, um, uh, given uh, in, in sequence. Um, it's, it encodes a full-length spike protein, but uh, to be honest, a lot of the information around this vaccine is, is, is quite elusive. Um, it's unclear as to whether or not it's in the pre-fusion confirmation. But they have published their data um, uh, recently um, of a, a phase three study with 22,000 people which reports an extremely good uh, vaccine efficacy of, of almost 92% with 100% against moderate severe disease. But um, there are some questions about uh, some of the transparency of the data that we're yet to see. Um, so it's also not clear like how this vaccine is going to be available to anyone outside of, uh, outside of Russia at the moment, I think. So uh, moving sort of swiftly on, um, I'm just going to briefly touch on a two, a two other types of, of vaccines. So firstly, and these are both more traditional types of vaccines. So uh, recombinant spike protein based vaccine. So um, Novavax have been developing their vaccine uh, around this concept of a recombinant nanoparticle. So they've taken uh, trimers derived from the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, uh, which they've uh, stabilized with this PSAT detergent core, and they've um, formulated it with this uh, saponin-based matrix M adjuvant um, to boost the immune response when it's given. And they selected this construct after uh, engineering 20 different um, versions, or more than 20 different versions, that they then screened for how well it bound to human ACE2, how stable it was, 
how quickly they could produce it and how immunogenic they were. And this was the best construct that they, they came up with. It's stable at fridge temperatures and really um, has generated uh, very good uh, safety and immunogenicity data at phase one and phase two. Um, uh, but they've, they've announced their uh, efficacy data via press release. It's not published as yet, but um, extremely uh, encouraging for a, a protein and adjuvant vaccine against COVID um, of about 90% uh, efficacy uh, in a study of 15,000 people um, with a really good efficacy against the, uh, against the B117 variant as well. Uh, in South Africa, um, where the, the variant was mostly the B1351 variant, the efficacy doesn't look quite as, as uh, good at around about 50%, but they did report 100% vaccine efficacy against severe disease, which is encouraging. And I'm going to touch a bit more on the um, on the, the the variants and the impact of variants in a bit. And then finally, um, the last sort of category of vaccines is the inactivated whole virus vaccines. Uh, and there are a couple of these that are being produced uh, by Chinese pharmaceutical companies. So the Bibip Core V, uh, produced by Sinopharm, um, which is so what they've done is they've taken essentially a strain of COVID isolated from a hospitalized patient. They screened uh, three, different, uh, three different strains and selected the one that had the optimal replication and generated the highest, highest viral yield in, in culture. Um, and then they, they passaged it through uh, 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 Vero cells to ensure genetic stability, and then they chemically inactivated it. And that's the essentially the basis of the vaccine, uh, which is stable at fridge temperatures. Um, and again, has been shown to be safe and, and immunogenic. And they have reported a vaccine efficacy of between you know, 79 and 86% in a phase three study in China and the United Arab Emirates. But unfortunately, there's no detailed efficacy results available and no paper to scrutinize. To scrutinize. But it's also being evaluated in Egypt, Jordan, and Peru. If this efficacy result is, is, is true and holds up to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, to scrutiny, then, then that really is very encouraging. Uh, and this vaccine has already been approved for use in a number of different countries. Uh, very, very similar is this uh, Coronavac, which is produced by a company called Sinovac. Very, very similar production method to um, uh, the other uh, Chinese vaccine. And the efficacy reports are very variable depending on where it's been studied and the region. There's no phase three data published again, but the, the efficacy reports range anywhere from 50 um, percent in Brazil to 91 percent in in, uh, in Turkey. Um, so really unclear at the moment until we can see the papers and scrutinize it, uh, very unclear as to how efficacious they are. Um, and there is a study um, that we are going to be recruiting for, um, well we're, we're, it's currently open for recruitment, um, of a very very similar vaccine to the the, the Chinese ones, the, the uh, live inactivated, uh, I'm sorry, not live, uh, inactivated whole virus uh, vaccine. Um, and that's open to recruitment now. Um, and um, and yeah, hopefully we'll get some answers. We're comparing it against the uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. So that's just an overview of the candidates. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, uh, I was uh, going to talk for a, a, a second part about a few of the uh, important questions. Um, but I thought we'd just pause there and just enable people to get a, you know, a glass of water or something. And if anyone wanted um, to ask any questions at that point, um, then I'm happy to, to take them. Hi, Tommy. Thank you very much for this very interesting introduction to the vaccine. Yes, there are a few uh, questions in the chat, so I'll follow in the order. So there is a... a a uh, question from Dr. Sings asking, how likely is immune escape from vaccine, especially when it comes to COVID? Is this something we see frequently with other pathogens? Is there a way to minimize this risk? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not, well, I suppose it is something that we see commonly in the context of, of, of influenza, I suppose. Um, so, uh, you, the uh, vaccination against influenza is, is very complicated and difficult um, because uh, flu has this uh, uh, amazing ability to rearrange its, its uh, genome um, to produce different uh, variations each year. Although there are a limited number of different variations that it can have, it does require um, 
you know, uh, almost uh, anticipation of, of which type of flu we're going to get each season to produce the optimal vaccine. And it may well be that we end up in a similar situation with COVID. It's, it's far too early days yet, really. Um, I'm going to present some data on um, the impact of variants on vaccine effect. Um, and so far, we haven't seen any clear evidence that it's, it's going to fully escape um, the vaccines. But it may do at some point. And it may be that we have a similar situation to flu where we have to select the op optimal vaccine um, makeup for that season um, based on, on circulating strains. Thank you. Then there are a couple of questions about the cost. Basically, why are the cost of this different vaccine so different? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, it, it's very difficult to know, to be honest, um, exactly why, uh, because, um, you know, when, when you've got va vaccines, the, the vaccines produced by um, Pfizer and, and Moderna really have been, you know, driven by, uh, by drug companies, essentially, who will need to recoup their, uh, their costs. Um, it's, it, you know, it'll be difficult to know exactly how much has been spent in the development phase, what the actual cost of production is. Um, uh, the, the, the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine um, was produced by initially by, by Oxford University, and then they struck a deal for manufacture with, with AstraZeneca. And um, uh, my understanding is, is one of their, their key sort of uh, stipulations from the outset was that this vaccine had to be uh, made uh, highly affordable. Um, so that it could be it could be delivered to places that that that, um, that it needed to get to. So I, I don't know exactly what whether or not the the costs tally up for some of the more expensive vaccines. Um, yeah. That's okay. Good. Thank you, Zen. Um, another question is: If an individual has been vaccinated, uh, might they need another within the next year or two? for a different SARS-CoV-2 variant that is to some extent you've already touched upon? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and we don't know yet. Uh, my personal suspicion will be uh, yes. I think, I think certainly at least a proportion of the population will need, um, will need booster doses is my feeling. Um, and I think the, the, the type of booster vaccine will be um, based around the circulating strains at that time is my feeling. Um, yeah. And uh, what do you think uh, of uh, uh, mixing different vaccines? There are, I know that there are clinical trials going on trying yeah. the different combinations. So I, I, I'm going I'm to talk about that in a bit. So okay. I'm, I might hold so, up on that. I've got a few slides. Okay. On. okay. Uh, somebody asked if any of the vaccine will protect the Indian double mutant. Yes. Uh, don't know. <laughs> um, again, are we going to touch on that? But nobody knows yet. Yes. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, how likely do you think it's for us to get assurance as a quality and validity of phase three data from Russia and China? Yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, it's 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 really tricky. Uh, to be honest, um. I mean, I suspect the Chinese papers will be published at some point, um, but uh, but they just haven't been as yet. Um, I mean, the speed with which these these studies are published uh, compared to 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 normal circumstances is just amazing. Um, you know, from reading through the, the you know the the the, the Russian phase three uh, efficacy paper looks good. I mean, it doesn't. Mm. Th there's not a huge amount to pick up on. Um, my my quibbles with it are really what's missing from the supplementary information. So they haven't published their protocol, for example, which I would like to see. Um, and uh, I know that some people have requested the, the data, but I'm not sure that they've, that they've uh, been up for sharing it yet. So it'd be interesting to see. I'd very much like to see the, the Chinese one. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm leading this, uh, this trial of this Valneva vaccine at UCLH, uh, which is very similar to the Chinese vaccines. And it'd be lovely to see, you know, what we can expect, but. And I have a question about uh, how much do you think that uh, um, the efficacy that uh, you know is reported depends also in 
on the countries where the vaccine has been tested because they could have different variants that have not yeah. been completely characterized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've got one or, I've got a, one or two slides on that as well. So, okay. Um, yeah. Um, and then there is another question here, and then we'll move on. They say, as the antibodies don't last forever in the body, why is nobody talking about memory cells that we uh, teach at a level biology? Uh, well, we are. Um, yes. uh, so, I mean, as I mentioned before, that's one of the... Uh, that's one of the, the key things that we're trying to produce. Um, and, you know, I, again, I, I'm going to mention a little bit about what, what I think are ways of, of generating good, um, uh, you know, memory B cells, um, you know, uh, how, how vaccine regimens can be uh, altered to do that. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's very important. Okay. Shall we move to part two and then we'll have more questions for you, I'm sure. Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do in part two is just try and um, try and quickly touch on some of the important uh, aspects. You know, now, now that we're familiar with the vaccines themselves, some of the the important aspects around you know, uh, some of the the key questions. So the first thing I was going to talk about was effectiveness of a vaccine. Um, so. Uh, efficacy is is basically the, the evaluation of how work well um, you know in, in terms of vaccines how well they work at preventing disease um, in a controlled sort of clinical trial setting but effectiveness um, is is a slightly different measure so effectiveness uh, evaluation is looking at how well they work in a real world setting so in a clinical trial there are various factors that may lead to um, slight uh, biases in, in your results. So for example, you have selection of your clinical trial participants. Um, you also have you know, lots of follow-up in your clinical trial. So you may pick up on sort of adverse health issues um, that you may not uh, pick up on if this was just delivered as part of a vaccine delivery program. So effectiveness is all about monitoring how well they're working in the real world. And this uh, paper in the New England Journal, which was out earlier this year, um, really was the, the is, is the first sort of data that, that gives us some reassurance about the, the vaccines working in a real world setting. So uh, this, this is a study from the population in Israel. Now Israel had uh, uh, an extremely uh, rapid uh, vaccination campaign. They secured an awful lot of doses of the Pfizer uh, 162B2 vaccine uh, and they started their vaccination campaign in December 2020 Whereas you can see in the uh, epidemic curve up in the top left, uh, top top right, uh, they really were on the upstroke of a, a pretty severe wave of COVID. And what they've done in this uh, effectiveness study is they've compared the unvaccinated people with those people who are vaccinated. So, and and the the evaluation here is all about the time that you spend uh, as an unvaccinated person. So as soon as you become vaccinated, then you um, can no longer be evaluated in that group and they've matched uh, vaccinated people one-to-one -one with with unvaccinated controls um, and uh, what they have demonstrated very neatly is that uh, vaccine efficacy as measured um, or vaccine effectiveness as measured seven days or more after the second dose of vaccine was 94 percent which is amazing um, and very much ties in with the um, the efficacy that was seen in the trial the one thing that was um, notably different uh, in this study is that they saw the deviation in those survival curves in the kaplan meier plot at around day 18, but otherwise uh, really matched very closely uh, what they saw in the efficacy trials, which is, which is fantastic. The other thing that they did in this study, which hadn't been done uh, in the uh, efficacy trials, was looked at whether or not uh, COVID, uh, the vaccines could protect against asymptomatic COVID infection which obviously is, is quite an important question if you're looking to get on top of transmission as well as just disease. Um, now, that whilst they didn't specifically measure asymptomatic COVID infection in this study, they used a proxy, uh, which was basically if they had COVID infection but didn't have doc documented symptoms. So they took the absence of documented sy symptoms as being a proxy for asymptomatic infection. And really reassuringly, they saw that if you looked at uh, that measurement endpoint at day seven or more uh, after their second vaccination, 
um, the, the protection against asymptomatic infection using this proxy measure was 90%, which is, which is brilliant. This has also been looked at in the UK. So the SIREN study is a, um, a, a large healthcare worker study, which is primarily being run by Public Health England. Um, and they've looked at this large cohort of healthcare workers um, and shown that the efficacy, uh, the effectiveness in this group um, is, uh, is 86% at seven, measured at seven days or more after dose two. And again, this is for the Pfizer vaccine. Interestingly, they looked at vaccine up, uh, uptake and vaccine coverage against uh, different groups as well within this healthcare worker cohort. And they found that there, there was lower vaccine coverage in, um, uh, in the groups that are listed there. So female gender, uh, the younger age group, non-white ethnicity um, and different occupations uh, and also in the people who lived in deprived neighborhoods which is um, in some of those some of those groups unfortunately um, it it's uh, uh, it was what was expected but it's also disappointing so a lot of vaccine campaigns have really got to be targeted at those uh, more vulnerable uh, groups who are less likely to, to take up the vaccine so, uh, Patricia, coming to your question about the um, about different countries and, and variants, um, one of the uh, very interesting places to look at, uh, in contrast to Israel, is is Chile at the moment. So they've got a population of around 19 million people, and they've vaccinated a very large proportion of those. So 12 million people have been vaccinated. Um, but you can see um, that despite that very uh, effective or very um, rapid vaccination campaign, they are still uh, experiencing a, a huge surge in COVID cases uh, and uh, it's really unclear as to why that is at the moment. So could this be the impact of a novel variant? So the P1 variant which is highly prevalent in, in uh, Brazil but also in Chile. Um, there is some uh, argument that maybe uh, that, you know, the government have come under criticism for relaxing their coronavirus restrictions a bit too fast. Um, but also is there an issue with the vaccine that they're deploying? So the majority of the vaccine that they're deploying have been coronavax, so the inactivated whole virus, Chinese vaccine. Um, and the efficacy of that vaccine when uh, that was announced when it was evaluated in Brazil was only 50%. Um, and they had, there has been a study uh, in Chile which suggests that after one dose, the vaccine efficacy of that, that uh, the efficacy of that vaccine locally is, is, is only 3%. So it's really not clear as to why um, things are, are so bad in Chile at the moment, but um, it is slightly concerning for a number of reasons. Okay, so um, the other thing that you look at after a vaccine has been deployed is you continue to, to evaluate the safety. So in the UK, we have this yellow card system, which is run by the MHRA. So anyone can submit a, a yellow card if they experience a side effect that they think is related to the COVID vaccine. And this is then monitored continuously. Uh, they have a very similar system in the US using the, uh, uh, the CDC, have this VAERS system. Um, and then this is continually monitored um, for, for any, any issues. And the first thing that came up in the post-deployment uh, um, uh, evaluation was uh, this uh, risk of, of serious uh, allergic reactions. So uh, a few people who are very early on in the deployment of the, the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines uh, experienced the most severe type of, of uh, allergic reactions or anaphylaxis. Um, and it led to uh, recommendations being uh, very rapidly uh, put out that people who had a history of multiple severe um, or unexplained severe allergic reactions should maybe uh, you know, hold off uh, getting vaccinated uh, with these vaccines until further information was accrued. But um, uh, it turns out that, you know, when they looked um, uh, in this study uh, of uh, over uh, 17 million doses of uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, only 66 cases of anaphylaxis were reported. So it looks like they were just unlucky um, and they're in that first sort of cohort of, of, of people being vaccinated, they just had an abnormally high number of, of anaphylactic reactions. But actually, uh, when it was, was evaluated after the, the program had been running for a, a little while, uh, it was actually a lot less. So the Pfizer vaccine, about 4.7 cases per million, and Moderna, about 2.5 cases per million. Normally, vaccines have about 0.3 to 2.1 cases per million. So it is slightly higher than, than, than usual, but still, um, uh, you know, very much likely that the benefit outweighs the risk. And anaphylaxis is a life-threatening um, allergic reaction, but it is treatable. Uh, and as long as people are observed 
um, after their vaccine uh, in a controlled environment, uh, they can be treated for these reactions. And it's, um, it, there has been some suggestion that maybe the polyethylene glycol that's in the lipid na nanoparticles, um, I think it's in the Pfizer vaccine, I'm not sure if it's in the Moderna vaccine, but there has been some suggestion that maybe that's implicated in the anaphylaxis to the Pfizer vaccine. So the, the next sort of controversial rare adverse event um, to talk about is the, is the thrombosis uh, following the AstraZeneca vaccine. So um, this first uh, came up around about mid-March um, when the use of the vaccine was suspended in multiple countries due to rare reports of clotting disorders. And at that time, there have been um, only 37 cases out of 17 million vaccinations. And at that time, it was mostly actually very common clotting disorders. So five deep vein thromboses uh, and 22 pulmonary embolis, uh, emboli, which, you know, these are common clotting disorders. And out of 17 million people, there will be a background rate of these, of these complications, probably in line with, with that. But then subsequent to that, these reports of a rare and serious clotting disorder, uh, often characterized by the presence of low platelet count or thrombocytopenia, started to emerge uh, and several of these patients presenting with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and uh, following a, an evaluation of these cases uh, they, they estimated that the, that the risk was about five per million vaccinated individuals uh, of this uh, of this thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome uh, and um when they when they they looked at how uh, this risk compared to um, the risk of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with COVID nineteen infection, you can see that five per million cases um, uh, is comparable to forty per million cases in the context of COVID nineteen infection, um, and actually it looks like there are some cases that follow um, uh, the mRNA uh, vaccination too. Um, possibly up to sort of four per, per, million, um, uh, per million vaccinated people. So the background rate of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis um, just outside of the context of vaccination is anything up to 16 cases per million per year. But um, bear in mind what we're comparing it to is the risk in the short term after vaccination, not, not, uh, not across the whole year. So this then becomes a very complicated or complex uh, risk benefit um, uh, uh, assessment to make um, that needs to take in a, a number of different factors. So what is the benefit of the vaccine to the individual? What's the benefit to the population? And what risk is this going to have on denting uh, vaccine confidence? And this situation as to what is the best thing to do is uh, constantly in flux depending on what is the background risk of COVID at that time, what is the efficacy of the vaccines, uh, including against the variants, and what really is the risk of these vaccines in um, in increasing the likelihood of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So uh, Cambridge University have produced these really nice infographics which, uh, which really help um, understand this sort of complex decision making. So at the top left, so basically these are all different scenarios based on the background risk of COVID. So on the top left is the risk um, when there's an incidence of COVID of two per 10,000 people per day, which is roughly what the UK uh, was in March. On the top right is an incidence of about six per 10,000 people, which is roughly the UK in February. And then at the bottom right, it's roughly, it's an incidence of 20 per 10,000 people per day, which is roughly where the UK was when it was at the peak of the second wave. And you can see it's a risk benefit uh, measurement of the vaccine, the potential benefits of the vaccine versus the potential harm, which the, the, the risk sways very much towards benefit to the vaccine as you look in older age groups, and certainly as you increase the incidence of COVID. But when you get down to the level that we're at at the moment, you're just edging it in terms of the potential harm from the vaccine versus the potential benefit in the group that are under 30, which is why the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunizations have taken the decision that you know, those people who are under 30 should probably not be vaccinated uh, using the AstraZeneca vaccine until um, either information changes and we get an updated idea as to what the risk really is, or we get um, uh, a change in the rate background rates of COVID. So if the background rate of COVID goes up, then it may well be that the, the JCVI then reverses that recommendation and says actually in the current situation it probably is worth being vaccinated. So very very complicated but the risk is likely to be extremely small. 
Um, but um, this is a, a serious complication um, and uh, there has been some uh, uh, papers now, or there has been a paper now published which, which maybe points towards the like, uh, possible mechanism. So this is a paper from Marie Scully which came out a couple of weeks ago in the New England Journal. So Marie Scully is a haematologist at UCLH uh, as well where I work. Um, so they evaluated 23 patients uh, with thrombosis from a variety of different centres and this thrombosis was temporarily associated so um, with, with vaccination. So they've been vaccinated uh, between 6 and 24 days between presentation. 70% uh, of those people were under the age of 50 and 21 out of 23 had no past medical history or drug history which put them at increased risk of thrombosis. And 13 of these people had cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and seven of the patients uh, unfortunately died. And of these 23 uh, people who were presenting with um, thrombosis and uh, low platelets, 22 of them tested positive for this antibodies against um, uh, uh, platelet factor four, which is an autoantibody, which has been implicated in another rare syndrome called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So it's a very similar syndrome that's seen after pe some people are given heparin um, uh, to thin the blood. Uh, they get this production of autoantibodies, which then results in this syndrome. So the causal link has yet to be ascertained, but um, it, there is some suggestion that maybe this is the mechanism behind it. Um, and also now this is, it looks like it's being seen for the uh, AD26, um, the, 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 the Janssen vaccine as well. Um, but, you know, essentially we need more information, but it looks to be a very, very rare complication. Um, and this is just to show that the, the Royal Society, uh, Royal College of Emergency Medicine, Medicine has produced some guidelines on how to assess these people, because unfortunately headache is a very common side effect post-vaccination, an awful lot of people are now very worried about it, but clearly it's not, um, uh, we need a, a strategy for how to deal with this because it's not possible, nor is it right to put uh, you know, everyone who presents with a headache post-vaccination through a CT scanner for what is a very, very rare complication. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to talk about is, is prime boost interval. Um, so uh, this was another controversial thing that, that, that caused a lot of consternation when the Joint Committee on uh, Vaccines and Immunizations around about the end of December announced that we were going to be delaying the, uh, the second vaccine dose. So what they wanted to do was maximize the first dose coverage. So as many people got a single dose as possible uh, and then take the boosting dose out to about 10 to 12 weeks. Um, and you know, a lot of people were very unhappy with that. A lot of healthcare workers were very unhappy with that. Um, uh, but it really was rooted in, uh, in, uh, in, in scientific understanding of how vaccines work. So we've got to bear in mind that these, um, the, the interval between the prime and the boost vaccines that was evaluated in a lot of the trials is, is often, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily picked because it's thought that that will be the most likely to induce the, 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 the best response. So the, the, the Pfizer vaccine was evaluated with a three week prime boost interval, um, so 21 days. But if you look at their initial protocol, they stated that they were going to evaluate it with either 21 or 60 days. So it was either gonna be three or 10 weeks. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, sorry, not 10 weeks, eight, eight, well, roughly eight weeks. Um, uh, but then they changed it in a subsequent protocol revision and they didn't really specify as to why they, they were changing it. They didn't give the rationale. And my suspicion is it's because they wanted to get the trial done as quickly as possible. The quicker you get the boosting dose of vaccine in, the quicker you can start collecting your efficacy endpoints and the quicker you can publish your result. The uh, Moderna vaccine was evaluated with a four week prime boost interval. And as discussed before, the Oxford vaccine was uh, evaluated with anywhere between a four and a 12 week prime boost interval. And there is some suggestion from um, uh, you know, the, the immunology that vaccines are rooted in that antibody titers may well be affected by prime boost interval. So the benefits of shorter prime boost intervals really are thought to be rapid induction of immunity, but in general, they're thought to be less um, desirable than longer prime boost intervals because you're likely to have fewer post-germinal center B cells uh, which are capable of long-term survival and it may impact on the durability of the antibody responses and on the quality of responses. So um, there are processes that go on over time after you've had your initial uh, priming dose of vaccine. So you get this process called affinity uh, maturation which is initiated um, within the germinal centers of lymph nodes and it takes 
several months after the, uh, the end of the germinal center reaction. Um, and you only really get these high avidity antibodies uh, induced once you've got sufficient time uh, having elapsed after priming. And it's why you have this sort of classical prime boost in uh, vaccine schedule, which is the kind of zero, one and six month uh, vaccine regimens, where to be honest, really it's probably the zero and the six month uh, doses which are most important. Uh, and in general, when you have that kind of uh, prime boost regimen, you get this sort of, the theory is you get higher affinity antibodies than primary um, responses alone. And we saw this when we were doing our vaccine trials um, for Ebola um, uh, back in 2015, 2016, uh, where again, in a similar situation, because of the uh, constraints of the epidemic um, that was going on at the time, uh, we, not by design, we had this variable prime boost interval very similar to the Oxford vaccine trial. And what we actually saw in our study is that we saw a, um, a correlation between prime boost interval and uh, antibody responses. So the longer the prime boost interval, the higher the antibody responses. Um, and you know that was evaluated up to about the longest we had was about 10 weeks. Interesting though, what we did see was a moder moderate negative correlation between prime boost interval uh, and specific T cell numbers. And they have looked at this uh, for the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. It's not been looked at for any of the others, but as a benefit of having this very variable prime boost interval as an exploratory analysis um, of the, the Oxford vaccine, uh, they have looked to see what kind of impact has this had on efficacy? Now, this is very important to stress that this is an exploratory analysis. The trial was not designed with these pre-specified endpoints, and there are all kinds of caveats um, as a result um, in, in this, in that, um, you know, for example, uh, all of the older cohort um, in this study had a, had a short prime boost interval. But you can see here, when uh, you look at two different measures of in, uh, immunogenicity, so the uh, the antibodies plus the, the pseudovirus neutralization and vaccine efficacy, it does look like longer primary boost intervals are maybe better, for the, certainly for the AstraZeneca vaccine. And then the other issue um, that was raised in the questions was this issue about heterologous prime boost or mixing and matching of vaccines. And this was the next controversial thing that came up. So when they published, so the Green Book on vaccination is, uh, is uh, basically the Bible for, for um, vaccine delivery. It, it's got all of the vaccines that are in the UK, um, uh, vac that are available in the UK and it tells you how to deploy them. And when it came out in uh, December for the COVID vaccines, it had this clause in it, which says, uh, for individuals who started the schedule and you attend for vaccination at a site where the same vaccine is not available, or if the first product received is unknown, it is reasonable to offer one dose of a locally available product to complete the schedule. So again, this caused a lot of consternation that people were going to be getting mixed and matched with vaccines. It was, it was never really the, the uh, intention. It was just, you know, if you were at site to have your boost of the vaccine and the other one wasn't available, you have what is available. But there are, again, reasons to believe that this concept of heterologous prime boost uh, may lead to, uh, may, may actually be preferable. And, you know, my personal suspicion is that it's unlikely to be detrimental but we have to do the studies to see so uh we again in oxford have evaluated this concept of heterologous prime boost for a number of different pathogens um, and particularly uh, most recently again we saw it with ebola uh, and this study here is data from a um a a challenge study in non-human primates, so in, in macaques, where they, they boosted, they primed and boosted the macaques either with uh, the same vaccine or primed and boosted with, with a, a different vaccine. And as you can see, 100% of the macaques, when they then challenged them with Ebola later on, um, were protected versus, versus only uh, 25 or 33% if they had the same vaccine. Obviously, this is a very, very small studies um, and they're in non-human primates, but it's interesting um, it's an interesting hint that the heterologous prime boost might be the way forward. But when you look in humans, um, and this wasn't comparing it against the you know, two doses of the same vaccine, so there's nothing to compare it against. But again, you can see that if you boost with the CHAD3 vaccine, and again, this is for Ebola, uh, and then boost with a different vaccine, the MVA, you get really a many, many fold increase in both uh, antibodies and T cells. So antibodies on the, on the left and T cells on the right you get several fold increase in the titers of, of both of these. And this has sort of been looked at previously uh, for flu vaccines, 
uh, this study uh, by Julie Ledgerwood, uh, NIH and team, um, where they looked at uh, a flu vaccine, so a DNA vaccine uh, based on H5 as the prime, followed by the monovalent inactivated vaccine boost. And in this study, they did actually look at prime boost intervals, so 4, 8, 12, 16, or 24 weeks prime boost interval. And they also looked at a, a, a homologous prime boost of two doses of the monovalent inactivated vaccine. And what they showed here is that if the prime boost interval was more than 12 weeks, 91% of the recipients had uh, antibody levels above what they consider to be the threshold, whereas uh, uh, antibody um, uh, a prime boost interval of less than or equal to eight weeks, only 55 to 70 percent um, uh, had uh, levels above the threshold. So suggesting again that longer prime boost intervals were better, but then when they also compared it with um, two doses of just the monovalent inactivated vaccine, um, only 44 percent, which suggests also that, that this mixing and matching might be beneficial. And so we have these trials that are running. These trials are being run by the University of Oxford, um, but we are um, uh, recruiting to these at UCLH. So it's called COMCOV and there's COMCOV2 as well. So COMCOV is basically where you have participants, they're vaccinated with either uh, AstraZeneca or Pfizer initially, and then um, they're boosted with either the same vaccine or uh, the, the alternate vaccine. And in this study, we're looking at both um, the effect of mixing and matching the vaccines, but also what is the effect of having uh, uh, of the prime boost interval. So some people are being boosted at, um, at four weeks and some people are being boosted at, um, at 12 weeks. And then the second part of the COMCOV study, COMCOV2, uh, we're taking people who've already received either the AstraZeneca or Pfizer vaccines in the national rollout program, and then they're being randomized to receive either the same vaccine that they had as the initial one, or uh, either Moderna or Novavax. And the readout for these studies is going to be uh, immunogenicity. So we're just going to look at their immune responses, um, not protection, but hopefully we'll be able to correlate that with protection. Okay, so on the home straight, we're just finally going to very briefly talk about uh, variants of concern. Um, so uh, I've, I've nicked this um, um, graph from uh, Duncan Robertson, who is regularly tweeting these updates, but it's, um, they're very useful. Um, and slightly scary because they give you a, uh, an idea as to what's happening with the variants of concern in the UK. This doesn't have the B117 or Kent variant on it. Um, it's only got the B117 when it's also got the E484K mutation. Um, so you can see the, the, the light blue at the bottom there is the B1617 variant that's currently uh, uh, causing a lot of problems in India. Um, and as you can see, the South African variant, we've got quite a few cases in the country as well. Um, so um, COVID is uh, a beta coronavirus, which has got this, um, you know, for an RNA uh, virus, it's got a very large genome, uh, but it's got this uh, unique proofreading mechanism that actually um, means that, that the, the number of mutations is actually fairly low. So nucleotide substitution at one, about one times 10 to the minus three substitutions per year, which is comparable to the, the rate observed for, for Ebola during the, the West African um, epidemic. So it's a relatively slow rate of, of, of mutation. But there have been a number of quite key variants that have been picked up um, with the majority of um, you know, key mutations uh, appearing in the uh, receptor binding domain. So the bit of the spike protein that binds to the human uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. So uh, notable um, mutations in these domains, including include the N501 position and the E484. Uh, these are mutations that are seen in some of the um, uh, some of the emerging variants that are, are, th are thought to be linked to increased transmissibility, and it's slightly unclear at the moment as to how they're linked to increased virulence of the of the, the virus. So this is just a table. Um, uh, just that summarizes the, the, the variants. It's quite difficult not to call them by the place that they were identified. Um, it's not, we're not really supposed to do that, but unfortunately the, the other names are not very catchy. But B117 is what's commonly referred to as the Kent variant, B1351 from South Africa, P1 in Brazil, uh, and then the B617 in India. Uh, and there has been some work to look at what the effect of these might be on on vaccine effect, on the effectiveness of the vac or the efficacy of the vaccines. So uh, the the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, um, they've they've uh, done an exploratory analysis in their phase three study against the B117 or Kent variant. And although uh, when you look at the immunogenicity, 
they've seen about a ninefold lower neutralizing antibody titers against B117 versus non B117. Actually, when you look, do an exploratory look at the efficacy, it still looks like the efficacy is about 70%. Uh, against B117, which is very reassuring, um, compared to about 81.5 against non-B117 uh, lineages. So interesting sort of hints maybe as to the, the immune mechanism of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine, that you can get a ninefold lower neutralizing antibody titer, but still retain the efficacy. Slightly different picture if you look at the against the South African or B1351 variant, and this is a very small study, and they've only looked at efficacy against mild to moderate COVID. So this, there were no cases of severe COVID, so they were unable to, do, to have a look at that, and the numbers are very small. Um, but unfortunately, in this small study, it didn't look like there was any effect of the AstraZeneca vaccine. So vaccine efficacy of 10.4%, but the confidence interval very clearly clock crosses zero, so no statistically significant effect of the, co of the AstraZeneca vaccine against the, the, the South African variant. However, um, we've got no idea whether or not it protects against severe disease and or death, and one would very much hope that it does. Um, okay, uh, on the other hand, um, they have looked at the, uh, the Janssen vaccine against the, the, the South African variant. Um, and um, uh, they've, they've uh, published on their efficacy of 52% um, uh, and 64% um, at 28 days uh, post uh, vaccination against moderate um, to severe COVID. So again, this is a slightly different endpoint to the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, but reassuring that it does seem to be some efficacy of the single dose Janssen vaccine, which has a very similar mechanism to AstraZeneca um, against severe disease um, in, in South Africa. The Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccines, we haven't seen any actual efficacy data specifically against variants, but they have published some uh, immunogenicity data. It does look like um, that there's still very good um, uh, immunogenicity against B117, B1351 and P1, the Brazilian, Brazilian variant, um, but we don't know what the impact this has on efficacy. And likewise, um, the, uh, the Chinese vaccines, Bibit, Corv, uh, and Coronavac retain good neutralizing activity against B117, but reduced activity against B1351. And again, we've got no idea what impact this might have on the efficacy as yet. So that's just to remind the emerging variants. I'm just going to wrap up now with a uh, just very quick slide on, um, you know, what can we learn from the COVID vaccine um, experience and uh, you know, to inform future pandemic threats. So, I mean, I think it's been a clear demonstration that the way forward is to harness existing flexible vac vaccine platforms to really accelerate uh, vaccine development in the in the you know, in the event of, of new pandemic threats. So mRNA vaccines and viral vectors are very, very adaptable, very quick to adapt and very um, rapid to scale up their production. But what we really need is more investment in the infrastructure um, to have uh, things ready to go in the event that we, we have another challenge. So both at the academic level, but also at the pharmaceutical and manufacturing level to generate very large numbers of doses of vaccines very quickly. And, and at cost. Uh, we need to develop better um, you know, new and adaptive trial designs to exploit clinical data acquisition. So in the uh, evaluation of COVID therapeutics, there have been some really fantastic things done, such as the recovery trial, which has allowed for lots of different arms to be introduced into those studies to allow for comparison of, of different treatment modalities. And I'd love to see something like that in vaccines, um, where we were able to compare very early on, for example, the Pfizer vaccine versus the AstraZeneca versus Moderna versus Novavax. Um, that would really help to advance the field. Um, and also, you know, the MHRA in the UK have been absolutely fantastic at rapidly uh, reviewing and approving vaccines. But, you know, considering how that can be optimised uh, to uh, create more pragmatic approaches to regulatory activities um, in future. So I'm going to stop there. So happy to take any more questions. Sorry, that was a lot to cram in. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, uh, there are quite uh, a few questions, actually. The first one from Sven Buckingham. Do you know why Chile used Coronavac if there is no published phase three data for it? Uh, probably because that was what was available. Unfortunately, there is... Um, 
there is a, a, a queue um, for vaccines and, um, you know, it's, again, it's probably what was, what was available to them. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of it has, has gotten has to do with, you know, who has been participating in their phase three studies. So a lot of the phase three evaluation of the, both, both of the Chinese vaccines has been in South America. Yeah. Um, and that's probably why they had access to the vaccine. And then there is uh, Wendy Moore that asks why, given the size of the COVID's new human host population and the ease of spread, how likely are non-spike protein mutations to occur and or contribute to vaccine failure? Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's that's probably going to be most relevant to the to the to the vaccines that are employing. Um, the whole virus, um, the inactivated whole virus um, mechanism. Yeah, it'd be interesting just because the UK's experience um, with these vaccines so far has been very limited with the with the inactivated whole virus. Um, yeah, it, I mean, one of the arguments for using that 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 type of vaccine is you get a more holistic immune response, but it may open you, it may pave the way for more vaccine more immune evasion and maybe that is you know part of the problem of what they're seeing um in somewhere like chile i mean because certainly there are lots of mutations outside of the spike protein um that, that may well have relevance and you have discussed uh, uh giving different vaccine at different time as boost or primary but what about mixing different vaccine into a single one would that increase much the risk of you know side effects or just would be a way you know just like when you do antibody you try to target a protein you can yeah. use more than one to increase the because so, so i mean yeah it's an interesting idea i i suspect um you're probably unlikely to benefit a huge amount from um mixing different vaccine modalities into a single uh, uh, into a single dose. What you could do, um, and what may have some legs, is uh, improving the uh, the adjuvant, um, which which would in, in, improve the immune response against the the one vaccine construct that you've got. So you know uh, the the protein subunit vaccines certainly require adjuvants to, to get a high uh, immune response. Um, the viral vectors, you know, the adenovirus itself is thought to be an, work as an adjuvant, basically. Um, so that tends to boost the immune response. What they are looking at, on the other hand, though, is they are looking at co-formulating these vaccines with the flu vaccine. Um, so whilst um, whilst I don't think anyone's working on putting more than one COVID vaccine construct into a single dose, uh, they are looking at seeing if they can combine flu and COVID vaccines. Because if people require boosters, um, yeah. It'd be nice to be able to do it all in one go. Yeah. And then we have a question. Um, to be clear, risk is risk versus benefit of say Oxford basically CVST. This is personal risk and does not account for population effects. So, for example, attenuation of transmission. That I think is a very interesting point. Uh, well, it it depends what you're talking about. Ab absolutely to the individual absolutely to the individual uh, but not if you're a policymaker if you are somebody who's making recommendations um, for public health measures then you have to consider both um, but if you're an if you're an individual or if you're a doctor recommend making a recommendation to your patient absolutely you're thinking about what is the what is the benefit to the individual but if you are somebody who has got to put in uh, recommendations for public health policy you have to consider both because whilst uh, at one point as i was trying to demonstrate with those infographics at one point um we might be saying we don't recommend this vaccine to the under 30s if we allow transmission to go out of control then the risk benefit shifts and all of a sudden because we've allowed covid to go out of control then we're saying oh well now we recommend it but everyone's in a worse position there because the risk of cerebral sinus thrombosis hasn't gone down um but there's more COVID around. So uh, it's really for the public health professionals, the, the population level bit. So, you, but you think that at some point, uh, the issue of attenuation of transmission, particularly if it's clearly demonstrated that it's still, for what I understand, not 100% proven with some of the vaccine. Yeah. Would be a consideration in the yeah, future. I, 
Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, it'll be there's still a lot of work to be done on that as to whether or not the vaccines prevent transmission. Um, the, there has been, as far as I'm aware, nothing published on the mRNA vaccines yet. But the Oxford vaccine, for example, one of the things that they looked at was in those people who had asymptomatic infection after vaccine, how much virus was in their swabs and how long did they shed the virus for? And they had less, the, vac the vaccinated people had less virus and they shed for a shorter duration. Um, what impact that has exactly on transmission, whether or not they can transmit at all, I, we don't know yet, but yeah, lots of work still to be done on that. Yeah. And there is another question on the Oxford vaccine that concern uh, the incident of clotting. Mm. And uh, they ask, uh, it's, uh, Gozel can ask, what's the reason? You mentioned platelet factor four, but did you imply that it was a genetic background that some people are... Uh, yeah, so, so again, it's, it's very, very early days. Um, and the numbers are probably too small at the moment. A number of cases are probably too small to make any large um, inferences um, or, or, or to have any clear pointers. Certainly female gender does seem to be, um, it does seem to be a risk factor. Um, you know, there are some risk factors for the, for the, if it is analogous to the heparin induced thrombocytopenia syndrome, there are some, um, there are some uh, um, some epidemiological risk factors for that. Um, so again, female gender, uh, younger age, and um, there are some uh, you know ethnicity contributions as well. Um, the risk factors. So um, it may well turn out that there are greater risk factors, and therefore the the recommendations may change based on that. And it, it's still too early days at the moment. You also mentioned that uh, in there was no indications that there was an influence of any drug. Did that include the pill? Because uh, if there are more women, yeah. and pill itself can have, you know, the contraception yeah. pill can have, uh, yeah, that side of side effects. It's accepted. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, that that was just in the. Um, uh, that was just in the, the paper by Marie Scully. There was one, I think there was only one patient in that group who was on the combined oral contraceptive pill. Um, uh, there was only one patient in that analysis. Like clearly all of these things will contribute. So, you know, if an individual is, has, you know, pre-existing prothrombotic complication or like uh, risk factors such as being on the pill, it will increase the likelihood, you know, of, of clotting complications, but not necessarily if it's a, if it's fully an autoimmune mechanism, um, then then uh, it makes it a bit more complicated, I think. And there is another question from William Waits. I would like to know what strain is being used as a basis for the Valneva trial. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's one from very early on actually in the um, uh, in the. <clears throat> I think it, I think it's from quite early on in the uh, uh, pandemic. So, I mean, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? I mean, one of the reasons it's been selected is because the uh, the the main sort of epitopes on the spike protein are homologous uh, across, uh, you know, uh, lots of different variants. But you know, development of these things takes a long time, and you know, it may be that. You know, we, we will have to wait and see what the efficacy is like, um, you know, whether or not it's impacted uh, by the variants. It's unclear to me for the, the whole virus vaccines. But, you know, again, this 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 idea of having a more holistic, a broader immune response because you're using the whole virus may actually be in its advantage versus the variants. So hard to remember. Then there is Jay Spain says quite a long comment. Basically, she has not been vaccinated yet. And normally, she has quite mild reaction for what I can see. But anecdotally, she says that uh, um, everyone she knows who has had the Oxford vaccine has had quite strong reactions. 
have to say I have not. Uh, and she'd like to know what's the apparent reason for these stronger side effects compared with more established vaccines for other diseases. Uh, and this concern again about the adjuvant, uh, whether they are different, uh, you yeah. know, just a vehicle so, in the vaccine. So, um... Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I mean, different people have very, very different reactions. Um, uh, my, my girlfriend did the, uh, did the, did the trial <laughs> that we were running at UCLH, the Oxford trial, and she was absolutely convinced that she had the placebo because um, she didn't have any, yeah. any side effects whatsoever, and then was very surprised when it turned out she had the AstraZeneca. Um, I think it's, it's just very variable based on the individual. I think, um, you know, these things are designed to stimulate the innate immune response and, um, you know, kickstart the, the process that leads to an adaptive response. And that can be really unpleasant sometimes, you know, um, this kind of uh, this innate immune activation. It's, it's generally, you know, harmless in that it settles down after, you know, a couple of days. Um, but it's very unpleasant for some people when it occurs. Um, and, and can be quite concerning, um, but uh, but why some people have it and some don't is actually something that we're we're, we're planning on looking at um, uh, in a, in a sort of controlled fashion. But we, we it hasn't hasn't gotten going yet. Um, but why some people have a reaction and others don't is is really hard to know. But but the reassuring thing is that you know the vast majority. I mean, there have been you know tens of millions of doses well you know i think hundreds of millions of the astrazeneca now of doses and um and you know really the the thrombosis thing is is the main thing that's come up but the risk of that is still very low um but but probably outweighing the benefits in the in the under 30s at the moment so there are a lot of people thanking you profusely for the talk and then Another question from Steve Cashman is, is there any work on effect of HLA class 2 alleles on antibody response? Um, interesting. Yeah, I think, I think Oxford have, have, have done that for other vaccines. Um, uh, and knowing that group, um, I'm sure they probably are doing it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but given that uh, we are mainly involved in the, well, we are really mainly involved in the actual implementation of the clinical trials uh, as opposed to the host uh, sort of immunogenicity side of things at the moment. I haven't seen that data, but I would be very surprised if Oxford aren't looking at that. Uh, okay, I think that's uh, can, the I, end. can I ask a oh. final question? Okay, final. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, okay. final question, yeah. The question I have for Tommy is that uh, uh, in terms of after vaccination and in general, what you expect of uh, uh, antibody detection? Because a lot of people certainly after a few weeks from uh, the, at least the first injection, sometimes even two, don't have a title of antibody. But the T cell response is really very important. So uh, mm. one of the general ideas is that not having you know high level, particularly if it has been detected with a lateral flow test and then not in the most sensitive way, uh, is not so meaningful. So can you comment on that? Well, I think it, the first thing to do is check what antibody tests you've had done. Because if you've had a, if you've had a, a either Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Oxford, you know, these, are, these will generate only spike antibodies. Yeah. And yeah. certainly early on in the pandemic, the vast majority of antibody assays were based around the nuclear capsid antigen or the N antigen. So you won't measure antibodies against uh, the N antigen if, uh, if, if that's what's been measured. If it is against the spike antibody, I mean, I've heard anecdotally uh, of, of people not, not mounting responses, although that's not really borne out in the, in the studies. I guess it depends on the threshold of the assays um, and there probably are lots of other contributing factors. I mean, it was kind of what I was hinting at when I showed that there was that ninefold reduction in neutralizing antibody titer against B117, and yet the protection didn't really seem to be affected that yeah. much. Yeah. Um, and it does suggest that maybe, certainly for AstraZeneca, maybe antibodies aren't as important as everyone thinks yeah. they are. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it is more of a T cell based yeah. thing, which has always been, to be honest, it's always been Oxford's soapbox. It's always been about, they've always talked about the advantage of their viral vectors is the fact that you get really good T-cell responses. Yeah. So. 
Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll pass on uh, the microphone, if you can say so, <laughs> to Kapu. Thank you. It's been a fantastic yeah, thank you. talk. Thank you so much, Tommy, and it's been very, it's our honor to have you for uh, having this COVID-19 talk and you spent uh, for a long time with us and thank you very much again.